In this lesson, we're going to go over the hydroboration oxidation reaction. So let's start with 1-butene. What is the major product of this reaction? In the first step, we're going to have BH3 with THF. BH3 is borane, THF is tetrahydrofuran, and tetrahydrofuran looks like this. That's THF. In step two, we're going to have hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and water. So this reaction proceeds with anti-Markovnikov regiochemistry. So what that means is that the group that we're going to add, which is an OH group, it's going to go to the less substituted carbon atom of the double bond. And so that is the primary carbon. So the product of this reaction will be 1-butanol. And so this is the only product that we get. This reaction doesn't proceed with any sort of rearrangements. There are no carbocations to rearrange. Now let's talk about the mechanism for this reaction. 1-butene is going to react with borane, which I'm going to write it like this. Now I want to compare this reaction to the reaction of an alkene with HBr. The hydrogen atom has a partial positive charge, and the bromine atom has a partial negative charge. The reason for this is because bromine is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so the nucleophilic double bond attacks the electrophilic hydrogen, expelling the bromine atom. And so we get a carbocation, and then we know that bromide will attack the carbocation. And so in the end, we get 2-bromobutane. So notice that the partially positive hydrogen atom goes on the primary carbon, and the partially negative bromine atom goes on the secondary carbon. Something similar happens in the first step of hydroboration. Hydrogen has a partial negative charge, and boron has a partial positive charge. The reason for this, if you look up the electronegativity values for these two elements, according to most textbooks, the EN value for hydrogen is 2.1, and for boron it's 2.0. So boron is slightly less electronegative than hydrogen. So that's why boron is partially positive. And so the double bond is going to attack the partially positive boron atom, just as in this example it attacked the partially positive hydrogen atom. And then the hydride ion will attack the carbon. Now this happens all in one step, so this is basically a concerted reaction mechanism. But we can see the same trend here. The partially positive boron atom goes on the primary carbon, and the hydrogen, which was partially negative with respect to boron, not with respect to carbon though, that went on the secondary carbon. And so you can see that same trend here. Now this step will repeat a second time. So another alkene molecule will react with the product that we just had in the last page. So I'm going to redraw it like this. So boron has one R group. It has one four carbon chain attached to it. And so the process will repeat itself. So the pi bond will be used to form the connection between the primary carbon and the boron atom. And then the sigma bond of between boron and hydrogen, that will be used to create the bond between the secondary carbon and hydrogen. Now I'm going to highlight those bonds. So this red arrow corresponds to this bond. And the blue arrow that we see here corresponds to this bond. So these electrons are now here. And the electrons in the pi bond is now here. So the process will repeat itself. Another alkene molecule will react with the molecule that we have there. And so I'm going to line up the hydrogen and the boron with the alkene. And so this boron now has two other R groups attached to it.
So now the boron doesn't have any other hydrogen atoms attached to it. At this point, it only has three R groups. So it can no longer add to an alkene because it doesn't have any hydrogen atoms to give up. Now let's focus on step two. In step two, we have hydrogen peroxide, hydroxide, and water. Hydroxide is a strong base, and so it's going to deprotonate the hydrogen peroxide molecule, giving us this species plus water. So now let's go back to the boron atom, which has four R groups, and it's going to react with the deprotonated peroxide ion. Now before the attack, boron is sp2 hybridized, so it has an empty p orbital, and so this peroxide ion can easily attach itself to that empty p orbital. So given us this intermediate, Now what do you think is going to happen at this point? Let me draw this out. So this is a CH2 attached to a CH2, CH2, and a CH3. Carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5 and for boron it's 2.0. So carbon is partially negative with respect to boron. Boron has a partial positive charge. Now granted, boron also has a negative formal charge. Anytime boron is attached to four elements, or rather four atoms, it's going to have a negative formal charge, as in the case of sodium borohydride. It's important to understand that formal charge and partial charge are not the same thing. The fact that boron has a positive partial charge simply tells us that it's electron deficient relative to its neutral state if it wasn't bonded to anything. Now, formal charge is something we assign to a molecule based on the number of bonds. So anytime boron has three bonds, it's neutral. If it has two bonds, it's going to have a positive formal charge. If it has four bonds, it's going to have a negative formal charge without taking into account the type of atom that's attached to it. So formal charge is just something we assign to it based on the number of bonds it has. So because carbon has a negative partial charge, it's nucleophilic relative to boron. And so it's going to attack this oxygen, expelling a hydroxide ion. And so we still have this oxygen, but now we have a butyl group attached to it. And we also have a hydroxide ion that has been freed. So what do you think is going to happen at this point? Keep in mind, the boron still has a partial positive charge. So the hydroxide is going to attack the boron atom. So once again, boron now has a negative formal charge because it's attached to four things. It has four bonds. And at this point, we can expel this group. By the way, this reaction is reversible. Hydroxide and the alkoxide ion that was kicked out, their reactivity in terms of nucleophilicity and base strength, they're about the same. They're both oxygens with negative charges. In fact, once we added the boron with uh, the peroxide ion earlier, at this point, this reaction is reversible. I forgot to put the other arrow, so make sure to add that. So all those reactions starting from here up to this point, those are reversible reactions. So now we're almost done. So this is what we currently have at this point. The last thing that we need to do is basically add a hydrogen to the alkoxide ion. So we do have water in this reaction. 
So we can use water to protonate the alkoxide ion. And this gives us our final product, 1-butanol. And so this is the answer. Now let's go over some example problems. So let's say we have 1-methyl cyclopentene. And let's react it with B2, H6, and THF, followed by hydroxide, peroxide, and water. What do you think the major product of this reaction will be? Now, it's important to understand that B2H6 is simply a dimer of two boring molecules. So it's just BH3 plus BH3. Don't let that confuse you. Now we know that this reaction will proceed with anti-Markovnikov regiochemistry. So the alcohol will go on the less substituted carbon atom of the double bond. So it's going to go on a secondary carbon. Now we're going to add a hydrogen and an alcohol. So I'm going to highlight that in red. So let's put the alcohol on the wedge. How should we place the hydrogen on a tertiary carbon? Is it going to be on the wedge or on a dash? It's going to be on the same side. So this reaction occurs with syn addition. So the two things that we're adding in the end, really, which is a hydrogen and an OH group, they will be added on the same side. That means the methyl group has to be on the dash. And the other hydrogen, which was already present, the invisible hydrogen, that has to be on a dash as well. Now, that's not the only product we can get we can get the enantiomer as well. So the H and the OH, they could be added on the same side, but going into the page. And so the methyl and the hydrogen has to be coming out of the page. And so these are the two products that we can get. Now sometimes, instead of seeing B2H6, you might see either BD3 or B2D6. Because let's go back to B2H6. On an exam, you won't see the hydrogen atoms. So therefore, your product may look like this. If we don't show the hydrogen atoms, the only thing that will be shown is the relationship between the methyl and the OH group. And those two will be opposite to each other. So for this reaction, you're going to get a product that looks like this, and the other one may look like this. So this would appear as if it's anti, but it's not because we didn't add the methyl group. The methyl group was already there. So if we use B2H6 or BH3, these will be our answers, which is the same as what we have here, if you want to show the hydrogens. But now, instead of using B2H6, let's use BD3, which has the same effect as using B2D6. So how will our answer change? So this time, instead of adding a hydrogen atom, we're going to add the isotope of hydrogen, which will be deuterium. So we're going to have to replace H and put a D instead. Now, on a typical Organic Chemistry 1 final exam, you probably won't see these hydrogens here. So your answer will look like this. And if you want an example of this problem, in an organic chemistry final exam, I have a video. And if you go to the description section of this video, you can access my Patreon page, and you can access, at that page, my organic chemistry one final exam video. And I have a question just like this. And it's a multiple choice question, and the answers look very, very similar to each other. Perhaps you've seen one of those situations. 
And you need to know this reaction well. You need to understand its regional chemistry and the stereochemistry behind this reaction to eliminate three of the four answers and get to get the right one. And so if you check that out, you can you'll find questions like this where you just really need to know your stuff. So make sure you understand this, because on an exam, your answer will be one of these two. And you have to pick the right one. So both of these molecules represent correct answers. They represent the products that can be formed in this reaction. However, on a multiple choice exam, only one of these two answers will be listed. And so you need to identify that right answer from the wrong ones. So make sure you understand this reaction well, because it's a very common exam question.